Thank you, Shoshana, for this very kind introduction. And I also would like to thank Celia and all the members of the committee to the, who invited me to this amazing symposium. Basically, it's a big birthday party. And I feel that half a century is a huge birthday party in anybody's life. And over the few couple of decades I've been associated with the PDB, I have seen not only this enormous increase in all the data that's been assembled in that repository, but also how people who are responsible for the PDB have continuously updated and reinvented the way with which they interface with depositors, users, and the overall scientific community. This is a tremendous achievement and everybody at WWPDB should be congratulated for this. Indeed, I think the PDB is a treasure trove. So what I'm going to do in my presentation is to first put the birth year of the PDB into context, then briefly describe my personal philosophy of what structural biology means in my work or integrated structural biology means in my work and give you three vignettes of how my NMR studies have always embraced other structural and biophysical approaches and what really integrated structural biology means to me. And I will do so giving you three brief examples. So what happened in the year 1971? Probably more than half of the audience hadn't been born then. I didn't take a toll, but I believe that we have lots of students and postdocs listening and they probably weren't born at that time. Here I've listed a few important events, obviously in a personally biased view. The Beatles had broken up, but each former Beatle had a solo album on the charts. It was an exciting time in space exploration. Apollo 14 lands on the moon. The Soviet Union launched the first space station. In the US, the 22nd Amendment got ratified, which lowered the voting age to 18. The first microprocessor was born and on ARPANET, chat rooms appeared. Around this very time in 1971, the May demonstrations, around 400,000 anti-Vietnam War protesters marched on Washington and 125,000 marched in San Francisco. And the Nixon administration arrested 13,000 of those in three days only. The New York Times published the Pentagon Papers, NPR was born. In Switzerland, women were granted the right to vote in general elections. However, not all cantons allowed them to vote in the cantonal elections. China was admitted a seat at the United Nations. And in the UK and in Ireland, they switched to decimal currency. So where was I in 1971? I was a student at the University of Cologne. And in the spirit of the early days of the PDB, as Helen told us, lots of us were activists then. Maybe one of the reasons I was invited to present here is shown on this slide. This is the first NMR structure that was deposited in the PDB. It was deposited early in 1989, and it's of a protein called BDS. 
And as Jenny Martin yesterday mentioned, at the time you were allowed to name your PDB ID when you deposited structures. Now we wanted to deposit an ensemble of structures because NMR did produce ensemble of structures. And we had to argue forcefully that the PDB accepted 42 structures for one protein. This was not easy. However, we persuaded them that that indeed was necessary for NMR structures. And thankfully, they accepted these 42 structures. So for the last 20 years, I've firmly believed and advocated for integration of structural approaches and also integration of all types of stu structural techniques with cell biology, biochemistry, other spectroscopies, in vivo studies and computation. Because if we truly want to understand how a molecule works, we need to get information about the disposition of all the atoms in space, who interacts with whom, and then we may have a handle of how this protein carries out its job. And integrated approaches are necessary because complementary methodologies look at a phenomenon from different perspectives. And it's only if we integrate these very different perspectives do we stand a chance of describing a particular phenomenon more accurately. And this is described in a paper that I published with my colleague Sandy Mitchell in the British Journal of Philosophical Sciences. Let me now give you three examples of how NMR is used in an integrative approach. And the first example describes how NMR and scattering sacks or sands complement each other. As everybody knows, in NMR, we record different kinds of spectra. And from spectral parameters, we extract distances angles, and orientation of bonds. All of these structural parameters allow us to determine an overall atomic model for the protein or the molecule at hand. In SACS, one collects scattering data and you get a scattering curve. And from that, you can derive overall shape envelope information. And then you can either use your atomic model to fit into the envelope derived from the SACS data, or you can actually combine both experimental data as restraints in deriving an overall structure. So let me give you the example that we worked on in my lab. For quite a number of years, we've worked on lectins, and in particular, proteins that are called CVNH homologs, and C CVN stands for cyanoverin N. Four of the members of this family are shown here. The founding member of the family, cyanoverin M, comes from a cyanobacterium. We determine structure of a, the related protein that comes from a fern, from the white truffle, and from Neuraspora. And as you can see, the overall architecture is very, very similar. It's an all beta strand protein with a C2 pseudo symmetry, although some of the loops and the tails and details are different and the sequences are different. Now, DNA sequencing becomes very, very fast and standard and 
basically sequencing a genome doesn't take more than a few hours anymore. So by that time, there were now a whole load of different sequences from all of these filamentous fungi and lower um, organisms sequenced. And this allowed the community working on those to group them into three classes, type one, type two, and type three CVNHs. And we determined structures of all of the belonging to all three classes. However, it was very curious to see that the type three CVNHs had a very peculiar arrangement. Instead of having the entire sequence in one go, in the middle of the sequence, there was a different domain inserted just from sequence considerations which was very unusual. And when you talk to geneticists or molecular biologists at the time, they usually would call this a pseudogene and they would say it probably is not really a functional or a folded protein. So what we decided to do to look at one of those uh, type three proteins. And when you look at the HSQC spectrum and that's the first thing that we usually do, we noticed that indeed the protein had a very nicely dispersed spectrum telling us that it is a well-folded protein. From relaxation data, and we obviously assigned the spectrum, we could also tell that the two halves of the CVNH sequence tumbled differently from the inserted lice M domain. So those two halves clearly were one protein domain and the lice M domain was a different protein domain. We then determined the NMR structure of this protein. Here is the CVNH domain. Here is the lice M domain and they look like they should look like this looked like a member of the CVNH family and the lice M, there was only one other in the PDB, but it looked like a lice M domain. And we deposited 25 conformal ensembles in the PDB. However, we had to deposit them as domain structures because clearly these two linkers where the domain gets inserted in the middle of the CVNH domain were very flexible. So we wanted to get an overall structure. So how do you do that? Obviously you can make lots of different constructs and we initially just started to reducing the linker lengths between those two domains as shown here. The linkers were very glycine rich and one of the final ones we made was having basically no linker at all anymore and that one crystallized while all the others did not crystallize. However, in this uh, crystallographic structure, the lice M domain really flopped down on the CV and H domain. So we knew this was not how it could ever be in the wild type situation. So another methodology needed to be employed. And we started out with running quite long molecular dynamic simulations. And for good measure, we used two different force field derived simulations. One was from the amber force field, the other from the charm force field. And we ran those for all the constructs we had. And just, and we ran 10 microsecond simulations. So what we noted that the Average RMSD values were relatively small for up to four microseconds, and the decree increased after that to roughly four angstroms for all of those. For the all the different constructs, the struct, the overall structure of the lice M domain was retained more faithfully than that of the CVNH domain. So how can we then go ahead 
characterizing the wild type situation. Here, the scattering approach comes into play. So we collected scattering data and curves again for all of our constructs. And I show here you four of those and use two different analysis tools. One, the Amber tool sex MD program and the Chrysal program. And you can see them shown here, the scattering curve and compared to the experimental curve. The experimental is here in the slide blue, the Amber FF IPQ force field in red and the CHAM22 force field in uh, magenta. And you can see that for Q values below 0.2, the curves agree very well, the experimental and the sex curves, uh, computed sex curves com uh, compare very well. However, for Q values above, uh, point uh, two, obviously we get more deviation. However, the deviation between the two analysis tools or force fields is very small. And this is sort of an outlier because here our experimental data was really very noisy because that particular construct was rather insoluble. So when you just look at the, the, the overall shape and one parameter you can use is the radius of gyration. And again, the color coding here is the same. We found that the, the radii of gyration that were calculated from the MC simulations were really off for the wild type and the long constructs. And it was only for the one with a short linker, here these two that we get some overlap between the experimental data and those where we can back calculate from the simulations. And there is a slight um, in better agreement with the charm force field than with the amber FFQ force field. So we still don't have our ensemble structure. For that, we went back to the NMR and collected paramagnetic relaxation enhancement values. Now, for those of you not in NMR, in contrast to all of the local constraints that we can measure with traditional NMR, small distances up to five and six angstroms and small angles, what you can measure with these PREs are distances up to 35 angstroms. And PREs can be back calculated from known structures, which then uh, permits the integration into structure calculations or the validation of candidate models. So the PRE approach is really the ideal approach to characterize conformational distributions. And that's what we needed to do in this particular case. So what I show here is the entire ensemble that was calculated for the wild type structure. And from the PRE set, we could extract two or characterize two sort of limiting conformations that are really only a very small percentage, 4% or roughly 7%, where the Lice M domain approaches the paramagnetic tag in two very different ways. Namely, as you can see here, there is a rotation of the Lice M domain around these two linker residues. And these two sets are mutually exclusive. This set does not contribute to the relaxation, paramagnetic uh, relaxation data of this one and vice versa. So in this way, it was possible to characterize the entire ensemble and these are 95% uh, confidence volumes here and characterize also two individual conformations in that ensemble. The next example I show is where we integrate X-ray solution NMR and cryo-EM. And this really is in the context of Pittsburgh. 
And Pittsburgh is known as the city of bridges. There are actually more bridges in Pittsburgh than in Venice. And bridges is what I believe need to be built between different methodologies and between different approaches and different people to try to understand what goes on in a complex biological system. And this is the system we are looking at. It's the Pittsburgh Center of Protein DNA inter uh, HIV Interactions, which we've established there. And we look at what happens in the immediate events when the virus releases the contents into the cellular cytoplasm. We've established a pipeline where we predict what interactions are present. And this is done to some degree by mass spec. This gets validated in the cell by microscopy. And in vivo, it has to be established that the interaction is biological significant. We make the proteins, we carry out screening by NMR, crystallography, and in the end, try to get structures of either the individual proteins or the complexes by whatever methodology is possible for us. And in this way, it was possible to determine the structure of an overall complete HIV capsid core. This, in, this was done by integrating cryoid M density of capsid tubes assembled in the test tube. We had a crystal structure of the NTD of dimer, uh, of the NTD and an NMR structure of the CTD dimer, which connects these hexameric units in the lattice of the assembled tubes. We, it, the interfaces we see in this overall assembled tube was then checked by muta mutational analysis of these residues in vivo. And indeed, we could show that some of those were important for HIV function. And the final conical core was assembled, getting the shape from cryo-ET of native capsid cores, a computational model where we used all the information that we had from the different methodologies to put this all together into a 42 million atom assembly. And again, the PDB was very helpful because it was impossible to initially deposit the structure of this very large core into the PDB, but a phone call to Helen and Helen as putting people into the right spots helped us to deposit this entire overall core into the PDB and you can download it and look at you at your heart's delight. So the last few minutes, I will tell you about the integration of solution NMR, magic angle spinning solid state NMR and cryo EM. And you have not heard a lot about magic angle solid state NMR, but I do very strongly suggest that the next revolution is happening in solid state NMR. For those of you who don't know, they, you can get the same type of spectra as in solution. And if you spin fast, the resolution is astounding and really looks almost like what we use, what we have in solution NMR. Instead of measuring NOEs that give distances, what you do, you measure correlations between carbon-carbon resonances. And while the proton-proton NOE scales with one over R to the sixth, these carbon-carbon uh, -carbon correlations scale with one over R to the third, and you can get distances up to six and seven angstroms. When you combine those data and structure calculation with a very low resolution cryo-EM map, you can then, in a joint refinement, end up with structures that are of relatively high resolution, even if you start out with a very low cryo-EM density, because all of those 
distances are what we can get fairly precise and accurately from solid state NMR. And in this way, we now have a in vitro assembled very large tube whose structure was determined by solid state NMR. And although the overall details in the low resolution cryo EM map, map, for instance, for loop structures, this N terminal beta hairpin or the side chain orientations could not be discerned from the cryo EM data. We get all of that information from the solid state NMR data. Now, with this, I have to say it's been a great ride in NMR. Lots of people have contributed over the years, and all the CVNH protein structures were spearheaded by Leo Corribin, a postdoc in the lab, and Carl Dibik was a student who did the structure of this unusual Magna Porta protein, where we had the two pro protein domains connected by very long linkers. However, I have to thank my current members in the lab that, who are listed here, and in particular, the group of Tatiana Polonova, with whom I started to do the solid state NMR, and I'm very grateful for all of their contributions. 